Good day to you. Hope you're having a wonderful day. We've been reading in the book of Deuteronomy, and last time we read Deuteronomy chapter 28. Now, chapter 28 was about the blessings and also the the consequences of disobedience, the blessings for obedience and the consequences of disobedience. Now we're ready to read Deuteronomy chapter 29. And this is going to be about... uh, about the covenant that God is going to have with his people going into the land here. And uh, my the heading in my Bible says the covenant in Moab. So we're going to read this. I am reading in the Amplified Bible. These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the sons of Israel in the land of Moab in addition to the covenant which he made with them at Horeb, Sinai. Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, You have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh, to all his servants and to all his land, the great trials of Pharaoh, which your eyes have seen, the signs and those great wonders. Yet to this day... The Lord has not given you a heart and mind to understand, nor eyes to see, nor ears to hear. I have led you in the wilderness forty years. Your clothes have not worn out on you, and your sandals have not worn out on your feet. You have not eaten bread, nor have you drunk wine or strong drink, so that you might know that I am the Lord your God, on whom you must depend. When you reached this place, Sihon the king of Heshbon and Og the king of Bashan came out to meet us in battle, but we defeated them, and we took their land and gave it as an inheritance to the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. So keep the words of this covenant and obey them, so that you may prosper and be successful in everything you do. Notice what the Lord is reminding them here. You've, your clothes have not worn out. Your shoes have not worn out. The remind, he's reminding them of all the things. Now, this generation didn't personally witness these things in Egypt with Pharaoh. But their parents did, and they've been told about those things. So, now Moses, of course, did see that. And so did Joshua and Caleb, you know, some of them. But most of these, most of this generation that he's talking to really did not see it personally. However, they have been following God for the past 40 years in the wilderness, and he has been taking care of them. They've not eaten bread. He's given them. He's given them food to eat. He's given them everything they need. And the idea was to teach them to depend on him, just like it says there, so that you might know I am the Lord your God on whom you must depend, which is the idea. So, and to, he reminds them that um, that these kings came out against them in battle, but they defeated them. They took over their land and they gave it to, you know, Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh. So he's reminding them keep the words of this covenant and obey them so that you may prosper and be successful in everything you do. He's, he's letting them know all these blessings and all these things he's done for them. So the idea is to encourage them to continue to follow the Lord and to keep his ways and to keep his commandments and to keep his covenant, stay in covenant with him. Let's continue. All of you stand today before the Lord your God, your chiefs, your tribes, your elders, and your officers, even all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and the stranger, resident alien, alien, foreigner who is in your camps, From the one who chops and gathers your firewood to the one who draws your water, so that you may enter into the covenant of the Lord your God and into his oath and agreement 
which the Lord your God is making with you today, so that he may establish you today as his people, and that he may be your God just as he spoke to you and as he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So God is letting them know that this covenant applies to all of them, even the resident alien or the foreigner, you know, the ones, remember there are some people among them that are basically their servants that take care of gathering their wood and doing things for them. There there are some of those people. So it's not just the Jewish people, but it's also some of those folks they have with them that decided they would rather be servants with them to them than be destroyed. It's not with you alone that I am making this covenant and this oath, but with those future Israelites who are not here with us today, as well as those who stand here with us today in the presence of the Lord our God. For you know how we lived in the land of Egypt and how we passed through the nations along the way, and you have seen their detestable acts and their repulsive idols of wood and stone, lifeless images, of silver and gold, which they had with them, so that there will not be among you a man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turns away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the false gods of those of these nations, so that there will not be among you a root of idolatry bearing poisonous fruit and wormwood bitterness, I want to pause just a second there to notice what he's call what he's uh, comparing idolatry to. It's it's poisonous. It's bitterness. It it gets into the uh, it would get into their nation. It would get into their people, and it would poison them and destroy them. Right? Because we're going to see over time if you've read the Bible, or maybe if you've not, but we are going to see over time. This will happen to them, or at least a lot of them. It will happen that when he, a renegade, hears the words of this oath, and he imagines himself as blessed, saying, I will have peace and safety, even though I walk within the stubbornness of my heart, rejecting God and his law, in order that the watered land dwindles away, along with the dry, destroying everything. The Lord will not be willing to forgive him, but then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy will burn against that man, and every curse which is written in this book will rest on him. The Lord will blot out his name from under heaven. Then the Lord will single him out for disaster from all the tribes of Israel, making an example of him according to all the curses of the covenant that are written in this book of the law. So realize here, he's talking about someone, he calls them a renegade, but it's someone who is not willing to follow God, but assumes that they get all his blessings anyway. That's not how any of this works. It never works that way. If you assume, well, I'm going to call myself, and that's just... Let's just roll that into today and look at that from a Christian standpoint. I'm going to call myself a Christian. I'm going to tell people I believe in Jesus. But then I'm going to go live like a devil all week long. I'm going to do whatever sin I want to, I want to commit. I'm just going to go do whatever I want. But I'm still going to tell people that I am a Christian and that I am with Jesus and I am saved. And I'm going to maybe even come to church when I feel like it. But the rest of the time, I'm going to live my life my way. I'm going to do what I want. And if that means I live like Satan, then so be it. That is not someone that is truly one of God's people. That is not someone that's going to be able to stand at the judgment and get into heaven. That's not going to work that way. So we want to be aware of that. You can't just say certain things. There has to be a lot of corresponding actions, attitude, heartfelt things, things that are really in in your heart. And he's talking about the stubbornness of my heart, rejecting God and his law. 
meaning I want to do what I want my way. So even back here, you know, they are being warned and thus we are being warned of that. That is not the right attitude. That is not the way to go and to truly be following God. Let's continue. Now the next generation, your children who come after you, and the foreigner who comes from a distant land, when they see the plagues of this land and the diseases with, with which the Lord has afflicted it, will say, The whole land is brimstone and salt, a burning waste, unsown and unproductive, and no grass grows in it. It is like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zebuim, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and wrath, all the nations will say, Why has the Lord done this thing to this land? Why this great outburst of anger? Then the people will say, It is because they abandoned, broke the covenant of the Lord, the God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. For they went and served other gods and worshipped them. False gods whom they have not known and whom he had not allotted given to them. So the anger of the Lord burned against this land, bringing on it every curse that is written in this book. And the Lord uprooted them from their land in anger and in wrath and in great indignation and cast them into another land as it is this day. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things which are revealed and disclosed belong to us and to our children forever, so that we may do all the words of this law. So this may sound a little odd, but you'll notice that God is also talking from verse 14 on. He's talking not just to the people that are there, but to all the future generations. Now, in a spiritual way, Christians are part of that, part of those generations, because as Paul mentions in Romans, we are grafted into Israel. We are Abraham's seed, as I think is mentioned in several places. Um, I was thinking, well, anyway, doesn't really matter what I was thinking. The fact is, we are grafted in, and we are a part of Abraham's seed, Spiritually speaking, we are descended from Abraham. So, and now that's in a spiritual way because we've been grafted in, all right? We, we don't have that genetic or, or bloodline, but we do have that spiritual descendants from, from him. And that's through Jesus. That's how we come to God and that's how we are grafted in. So, with that in mind, if you look at this, this does apply to us in ways, in the sense that we also should not have idols. We should not be worshiping other gods. We should not be putting other things in front of God or rejecting his law. Now, we follow the Lord's law of love that he gave us in the gospel, so that's what we should be following. But still, these types of punishments or negative outcomes, they are the result of not following the Lord. And we have been told to do so, right? We've been told to do so and how to do that. If you read your Bible, if you study your Bible, you will understand what is expected of us, which is part of this last verse. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. There are things that we don't know and those belong to God. We're not responsible for those things. We can't do anything about those things. We don't know about them. But those things that he reveals to us in his word, how we should act, what we should do, how we should be with each other, all these things that he reveals to us, those belong to us. We are responsible to act those out. We are responsible to make sure that we follow those. And that means to us, it says to us and to our children forever. So we should be teaching our children, right? So it's not just us, but we're responsible to 
teach our children and show our children so that we may do all the words of God's law, so that we may live the way God wants us to live and follow the Lord correctly. And that's really the idea here. This shows you a um, another set of consequences for not following the Lord. And you'll notice that the land will become horrible. And, you know, when we see... I don't know how everybody else feels about this, but when I look at the land of Israel and I see all the videos and different things where people are there, it does not look like a lush, promised land. Maybe it was at one time, but it does not look that way to me now. And it makes me wonder if some of this punishment has not already happened. Just just mentioning that because he says, you know, When they see the land, they're going to say it's a land of brimstone and salt, a burning waste, unsawn and unproductive, and no grass grows in it. And most of the times, from the videos I see, it doesn't look that good. It doesn't look that lush, or, you know, it doesn't look like a land of milk and honey or or having a lot of good grass or anything. So, I just wanted to mention that because maybe that punishment has already happened, at least to some degree. So I want to thank you for listening. Hope you have a wonderful day. May the Lord bless you and keep you safe. And remember, God loves you.